Good afternoon. My name is Brian Riley. I'm with Trimax Systems, and we are the systems integrator that provided the PRV upgrade system to the 1050, 1158, and the 1059, 30 zones to transfer water between the two systems. And what I'm going to train you on today is the, uh, the way it operates, the way the controls work, uh, the flow meters which we provided, and the, the programming which is the PLC and the HMI uh, screen changes. Uh, first thing I want to tell you though is on the very back page of your training menu that you have in front of you is, that's okay. I don't have it, but you have a notes page on the very back. So if you want to take notes, that's there for you. You can take notes. Um, and if you don't, it's okay because there's no test. I know the protocol is I'm supposed to tell a joke, but I'm not very good at telling jokes and it wouldn't be funny and I'd be the only one laughing, so I'm not going to tell any jokes today, but I'll try to be funny while we're training. Um, First thing we're going to talk about is is the the ABV flow meter itself. Have any of you guys worked with these ABV flow meters before? At least one of you has. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna talk to you. Uh, I'm gonna cover four. You can follow along with me on the training outline if you want to, which is in the second page of your handout. Uh, we're gonna go over operation, maintenance, troubleshooting, and setup. Uh, as far as operations goes, turn to the, uh, the third page in your manual, which is, it looks like this. And this page isn't from ABV, it's from a different manufacturer, but it provides a real good description of how a magnetic flow meter works using uh, Faraday's law. And Faraday's law just states that the voltage induced across an electrical conductor as it moves at right angles through the electromagnetic field is directly proportional to the velocity of that conductor through the field. Basically what that means is a mag meter puts in it, uh, a mag magnetic field into the pipe and as water which conducts electricity flows through that pipe it changes, uh, it creates a flux inside that magnetic field and the mag meter can sense that, that potential variation and it gives you a proportional feedback in flow rate of the water. Uh, there's, there's really not much to it. I looked up a lot of a lot of sites and everywhere you find has very little information on the operation of a mag meter. It just, it just, it's a magnetic field and the water flowing through it. So, relatively simple. Um, and when they go bad, there's really not much you can do. It's, it's all factory stuff. Uh, but they very rarely go bad once you get them, get them started up. Uh, also, if you turn to, in your uh, ABB manual, if you turn to page 25 in your ABB manual, page 25 shows you the, uh, the contacts and the different types of outputs that are available on the, the transmitter for this flow meter. We've got, uh, if you look here, we've got, um, let's see, is that the page I want? Yeah, okay, what you want to do is, is look at page 25 and 26. There's a, a frequency output, and those are the terminals on page 25. Those are not used on this project. And on page 26, it shows where the 4 to 20 milliamp it is, which is what we're using. We're using the 4 to 20 milliamp signal to report flow rate back to the PLC and it also gives you an alarm output that is configurable that's also not used on this project. Uh, but those are basically the entire operation of this flow meter. What the, what the flow meter is measuring is the water flow through each PRV. So you've got two PRVs, one between 1050 and 1158 and there's a flow meter in series with that that tells you how much is flowing through that PRV and there's another PRV in, in between the 1050 and 930 and the flow meter is also again reporting how much water is flowing through that PRV. Anybody have any questions so far? Alright, uh, maintenance, there's really not much uh, you can do on maintenance with a mag meter. Pretty much uh, the only thing you can ever do is just check your grounds and when it comes to checking grounds in uh, if you turn to page 17, that shows you how it's supposed to be grounded. Sorry, I'm bouncing all around here, but my, my syllabus doesn't match the order of the, of the manual that's provided by ABB. 
But uh, that's the only really maintenance there is. Uh, check the grounds, make sure they're tight, make sure your wires are clean, stuff like that. If you ever get any errors, that's one thing you also want to check too, is make sure your grounds are good. The only other thing that you can check is, where did I put it? Yeah, that's, that's about it, is make sure your grounds are good and the thing should work just fine all the time. Do you use grounding rings? Yes, yeah, they do have grounding rings installed. So you don't check you don't check the electrodes or the coils. No, there's nothing you can do. That's e even if you called me back and said, "Hey, it doesn't work." There's nothing we can do either. We ship it back to the factory and let them deal with all that stuff. It's really uh, technical, and they don't let anybody but themselves mess with it. Uh, troubleshooting. Uh, first of all, with troubleshooting, if you ever notice that you have any errors. Uh, some of the things you can do, and like I just mentioned, you check your grounds, and that's on page 17. Uh, that's that's the first place you go. That's the first place I will go. If, if you call me out here, I'll check the grounds, make sure the grounds are good. The the second thing I'll do is you have to have a full pipe. If it's if it's acting funky, and the the flow meter of the pipe is not full of water, it's going to give you a weird reading. So when you're troubleshooting and trying to find what's wrong with it. That, that's, uh, that's another thing to remember is uh, the pipe's got to be full of water. And that's why I don't have it marked in my, my book here, but let me take you to a certain page where you can see where it's at. It's in installation. Turn, please, to page, page 6 in your manuals. If you look at that bottom diagram there on page six, you notice that they have it set up so that even when there's no flow flowing through the pipe, the way it's, the way it's constructed is there's always going to be water in that pipe. And that way you won't get any errors. It'll show you a value of zero, but it's designed to have water in the pipe. Uh, also on troubleshooting, in addition to checking the grounds, uh, turn to... Turn to page 27, please. Page 27 uh, shows you your test points on the card so that you can test uh, the current, check to see what the frequency output is, and see if your alarm contacts are in use. Like I said, on this project, we're not using the frequency or the alarm but you can connect a meter across those 4 to 20 points on, on this page and check and see what your 4 to 20 output is. So if you know you've got flow flowing through the pipe but, but your HMI is telling you there's no flow, the first place you go check is you check right here on, on 31 and 32 with the meter. Check and see if you're getting between 4 and 20 milliamps of current. And if you are, that helps isolate the problem. Um, that's, and that, in order to do that, when we get out there, um, as long as Steve doesn't mind, We'll take the cover off of one and open it up and let's look into it and see how it goes. But that'll be up to you, Steve. That's fine. Okay. Um, and then and you just check that and see if see if you've got current. Uh, the other thing that can happen is is if we got a fuse. There's a fuse in there that's field replaceable, and that's on the very next page, page 28. I don't have it highlighted on on all. Of, all of your books, but I highlighted in mine. Uh, this little uh, blurb right here shows points exactly where the fuse is. And if you look down here, it's got the list of the exactly right fuse to use to replace it and the manufacturer. So whatever you need, if you ever need to replace it, this is the page you look at for replacing that fuse. Uh, thing with replacing the fuse, always remember something caused that fuse to blow, so you need to think about having it looked at and try to isolate what the problem is. Again, you can call us for that. Uh, we have, I believe it's a one year, maybe a two year warranty on this project. Uh, the next page shows the DC fuse. Draw a line through that, because we don't use the DC fuse. So on, on page 29, that's obs that page is obsolete. All right, well let's say something goes wrong with your sensor. Your sensor goes bad, or one of your conduit gets dug up or the wires get corroded or who knows what have you. Uh, if, if the 
transmitter itself doesn't see a connection to the sensor, you're going to see the error, no sensor detected. And this is what it looks like. It's, a, it's the middle paragraph on page 33. I'm sorry, I didn't say page 33. Uh, so if the sensor goes bad or the communication with the sensor, this is the error you're going to get. And uh, it, when it tells you this, you're going to have to get a hold of us. And we'll try to isolate the problem. And if it's not something we can correct, as mentioned before, we'll ship it back to the factory. That's, uh, that's pretty much it on the troubleshooting. Check the grounding. Make sure the pipe is full. If you've got no power, you can check the fuse. If you're getting a, a wrong signal on SCADA, you can check your 4 to 20 right there on the, uh, on the um, circuit card itself and then see if you've got a no sensor detected because those, those are all the steps I could do too. If you guys want to do it, you're welcome to. If you don't want to, call us out. We do it. So. Uh, for setup, how to set up this meter. Now this is already done, so we're not going to do it. But let's say it loses its programming or it loses its configuration. This is on page 32. Starting on page 32, we go through the steps for the easy setup. And right now that sensor already has programmed the pipe diameter, the maximum flow rate. It's configured to read in. Uh, I think it's U.S. gallons per minute, if I'm, if I remember correctly. We'll verify it when we get out there. Um, all the all the configuration starts on this menu. So if you ever did need to do it, that's how you do it. But ideally, it's best if you give us a call, let us come out and deal with it. And that's that's really all there is. There's, there's not much to this thing. It's super complicated and yet super simple at the same time. Does anybody have any questions? Are there bypasses installed for these millimeters? In case if one does go down, you know, we shut down the system? <laughs> just, just your existing piping. Am I right, Steve? Yeah, and since they're above ground PRVs, um, we use them just as a supplemental source to the zones during peak demands and stuff like that. So it's not as crucial to, it's not like there's always water flowing through them. So we can schedule times that there are water flowing. No fault codes or on air or anything. Just the no sensor required, or no sensor detected. Sorry. Okay, like say you do have an irregular reading, and is there any resistance values to check on the if if, if your if your probe is bad, if one of the probes is bad? No, there's there's nothing we can check either. It's just because because I check my flow meters at RP4. Is we've that right? Got, we've got I've got Crohn's. Uh -huh. Turbos, uh, uh, what's that name? Andres Hausers. Okay. And I've talked to all the reps or, or tech services on all those companies, and they've given me resistance values to look at for troubleshooting. Okay. And and uh, I mean that's what you really need. Like say right. if, if you've got an irregular reading, you know you need to check your electrodes. Right. Make right. sure make sure the resistances are, are correct or not. The the or coil the resistance, right. And the coil resistances. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I don't know about that. Um, if it gets to that point, we'll get a hold of ABB and if they tell us what we have to check and verify, we'll do it that way. But I don't I don't have that information and typically I wouldn't get it unless we had a problem and I would call the factory and if they told me, check this resistance here. But I've never had to work on one of these flow meters, so I, I honestly can't answer can't that. Can't you just check it while you know it's good right now and record that reading, and then you'll know later? Yeah, but then if there's if there's, there's coatings, if there's coatings, if there's coatings, because you're gonna get a you're gonna get a different resistance reading right now when it's new than when it's installed. So they give you an average. They said it should read within this. Is the 4 to 20 loop sinking or sourcing? It's sourcing. Did everybody so, hear so that? you had a one year uh, warranty on this? It's either one or two years. Yeah, I don't, okay, I don't we get know. monthly, um, biannual work orders for these meters and stuff. Are you going to come out and do that work? If you have a service contract, yes. yes no. <laughs> no, we get, we get them uh, routinely with our our maintenance system. Okay. 
So we'll be doing those. Oh, I see. Okay. Routine maintenance. So that's, what that's why he's asking the question about the uh, coral resistance. That might be part of the uh, routine maintenance checks we'll be doing. Just clean off the lens. That's all you got to do. Just clean off the lens. No, <laughs> so you get rid of it. With these type, we don't need you guys anymore, Jack. You're all fired. <laughs> I'm looking in the wiring section, looking for the wiring section right now to see if it tells me about anything that you can check as far as coil resistance or anything like that. Well, it would actually be under troubleshooting. There is not a troubleshooting portion in this manual, no. Not in this one. And th this is the manual that ABB provided to us. So what I had to do is go through and pick out what I know about flow meters and pick out the information they give me and put it together and try to give you guys something useful. So I, I apologize if I can't give you all the information that you need, but um, this is what I have to tell you. So. Is there a manual that came with the flow meter? This is it. This is it. Yeah. This is what came in the box with the flow meter. Mm -hmm. Hey. Go. They're fired by thinking of it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it drives the four to 20 oh, or something. Sends the voltage to this to supply oh, no, the He said it was source. Source. So it's um, sending out the right zone. Oh, that's the right zone. Is that the same thing? Yeah. Your it's name is Power you know, the closest thing I can yeah. find is on page 27, but it's just got the wire colors. Whatever's required, that's what we used for the materials, so I don't, I don't really know what Good we answer. required at this point. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not the instrument guy. I'm not the instrument guy. Yeah, the messenger. Right. We do a good job here. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we can go go uh, switch over to the control panels right now. Oh. I'll talk about the control panel itself when we get over there, because we're going to go a little bit later. We're going to go down to the. Uh, the pump station, the control room for the pump station. We're going to go look at the, uh, the PRVs and the uh, flow meters and then the, uh, the HMI screens. We're going to look at the HMI screens. Uh, the first thing I want to talk to you on, on the PRV itself is the PRVs have a hy hydraulic, hydraulic controls. Uh, you guys stop me if I'm telling you something that I don't need to be telling you. Uh, so what, what happens with the hydraulic controls is it's an override in case our system doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Uh, let's say um, that I've got a PRV programmed to open at 60 PSI. These are hypothetical numbers because I don't know what they're set to right now. But let's, let's say we've got it set to open at 60 PSI. If my system fails, if the PLC fails or whatever, you're going to have distribution problems. The, the PRV itself is set up with a hydraulic override that if it gets to 50 PSI, it'll open regardless of what the SCADA controls are telling it to do. And I can't stop it from doing this. The only thing that can stop it from doing that hydraulic controls is uh, change the settings, the me mechanical settings on the PRV itself. The same thing with the high end, if, if my maximum that I can control it to is, say it's 110, then the PRV might have a, a high end mechanical setting of 120, that if it gets that high, in other words, if my SCADA system fails to do what it's supposed to do, it's the fail safe, the PRV will close as it needs to, or open close, vice versa, whatever it needs to do. But the, the hydraulic dead bands are outside of what my controls are going to control the PRV to do. So if it ever gets, if the pressure is ever too low and you see the PRV closing, or if it's too high and you see the PRV opening, and the skate is not telling it to do that, it's because of the hydraulic override that's built into the PRV to protect the system. So uh, it's just a fail safe to make sure nothing goes wrong. 
that's not written on here, but I did want to uh, mention that. Does anybody have any questions about that? Does everybody understand how that works? All right. Um, oh, that is on here. That's B, hydraulic control of PRV. Uh, so when it gets outside those parameters, I can't control it. Yes, go ahead, Adrian. Good question. Um, are those, are they locally stamped at what they're set at? No, they're not. They're not. Um, so we have to look at a manual to see what they're set at. Right now, I know that the, the operate or the, I know Steve knows what it's set to, and he just walked out. I was going to ask him. Steve knows what they're set to, and there's some people that, that run the operations down here. Victor will know what they're set to, that knows what those parameters are. I don't know for a reason because I don't want to know. I don't want to have that in the back of my mind that that fail safe is there. I want to make sure that my programming operates correctly regardless of these, these hydraulic set points. So whatever they're set to is what they're set to, and they, they, that's been set by Clay Val and uh, IEUA operators. So that um, I can, if I can get a hold of Steve or Victor again today, I'll try to find out what they are. I think uh, Jeff Traga at PCS also knows what they are, and John might know. If I can find out before the end of the day, I'll let you know what, this, what the settings are for both. But it wasn't set by us, it was set by the agency and Clay Bell. Uh, and like I said, we cannot control the PRV outside of those parameters. One of the, the main focuses, main emphasis is of emphasis, is, emphasis, I don't know, uh, on this project was to get the reservoir filled on a time of day mode and instead of running the pumps the 1158 pumps on pressure what they do now is they run on a time of day if you turn, turn in your uh, HMI manual you've got the HMI manual right here it's only five pages turn to page four of that manual What's set up on there is a 24-hour clock with operator set points that are optimized to fill the reservoir at night when the, when the power costs are lower and to use less pumps to maintain the, the, the level in the reservoir during the day, save pumping costs, and take advantage of the pressure in the system to supply all of the customers and not have to use pumps to supply customers. So fill the reservoir at night and let that pressure in the reservoir provide the service during the day when the weather's hot and people want to not have the pumps running because it costs more. So what we do, what we've got set up on there, if you look at the, the bottom graphic on here, I'm sorry they're not very easy to see, but the bottom graphic on here has a, uh, a, a target number of feet and a target number of pumps to be running at that, at that time of day. So for example, We'll put in there uh, the target number of pumps at 1 a.m. might be 2, and the reservoir level they might want to have it at that time at 22 feet. So we'll put those, those parameters in there, and at 2 a.m. it might be 2 and 24 feet. And at 3 a.m. it might be 2 and 26 feet. And so on and so on. And, and what happens is the, the PLC program has an algorithm in it that will take the current level, whatever it's at, and it'll, it'll perform an algorithm based on the, the dead band that's also set in there, which is how, far, how, how much error you can have between the current level and the target level. It'll take the dead band, the target level, and the current level, 
and it'll adjust the number of pumps to run up or down based on how far off of this target number that it is. So, for example, if you have a dead band, dead band over here, a dead band of 0 0.5 feet, okay, if you have, uh, if your target number is 22 feet in the reservoirs, and it says to have two pumps running, if you're more than 0 0.5 feet off of that, then it's going to adjust the number of pumps that are running. So if the target number of pumps is 2 and, and the target level is 22, if there's 21 feet in that reservoir, then it's going to run three pumps. And if it's 22 feet, it's only going to run two pumps. Because that's the, that's the target reservoir level and that's the target number of pumps to run. So um, what it's going to do is it's going to add extra pumps if it needs to to compensate for the requirement for additional water up in the reservoir. And if you're over, it's going to subtract pumps. So if you have um, at 2 o'clock in the morning, if you have 24 feet, then what it's going to do is the target number of pumps is two, but since you're two feet over, it's going to subtract two pumps, and, and it's going to actually run zero pumps for, for that hour. Um, the one caveat to this is the wet well level. The, the, the wet well level here at RP1, there are also wet well level set points. Where's my blue pin? There's, a, there's an operator set point for a low wet well level. And if that low wet well level is achieved, I think right now it's set for 17.5 feet. So if the wet well level drops down to 17.5 feet, what's going to happen is we're going to reduce the number of pumps again by another one pump. That way we save the water in the wet well. And if the wet well level continues to fall, we'll continue to subtract more and more pumps from the number of pumps running that's generated by the algorithm algorithm that tells the controller how many pumps that need to be running. Uh, doing it this way is the most efficient way to provide water to customers and to store and to use the pumping resources that we have at wall maintaining the supply that you guys have here at IEUA and RP1. Does anybody have any questions about that? <clears throat> your wet well level is your primary control, and your time is your secondary. <clears throat> well, actually, the this is the primary control. Well, how can it be if your wet well level drops below set point? They both work together. I, I agree with what you're saying. It's um, cascade. Cascade, yeah. Exactly right, yeah. So if your wet well level is within your parameters, then your time is going to be controlled. If it's not, then your wet right. well level will be. Exactly right. Exactly. The wet well level will override what this does. Right. The wet well, the wet well level, depending on how far off it is, will provide a shed value to tell how many pumps to shed from that number. So this number is generated first, and as long as the wet well is doing what it's supposed to be doing, this value, this algorithm is going to control it. But if if the wet well level falls below the set point, yes, it will override that control. The well well is permissive basically. Exactly right. Um, the other thing that we have going on in here is if we ever drop, we have theoretical numbers, we can drop as low as negative one, negative two, negative three, and if we get to those points where we, we have What's your reasoning to saying that? 
number of and pumps in the first place. And basically, you got a PID loop Which controlling could how many pumps you put on the valley, what based right off a level. That's the 1630. Anyway. That is the way the uh, control strategy was written to provide an, an, an initial number of pumps. The, the the program could could ignore that and work just fine, but it was written to provide an initial number of pumps to be to rush. So, so when you first potentially, yeah. Like I I didn't write the control strategy or the specification. Uh, I just know that was the way it was written, and that's what, what, what was what we were required to do. But I agree with you. It's kind of exactly. Yeah, you could have said you could put 17 in here, and it wouldn't matter. The program would do what it's going to do. Yeah, exactly. If that was a minimum or a maximum, I would understand. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, what Joe asked me is what what benefit is it to provide the number of pumps required? And uh, you know, I've I've had the same conversation before. Is the, the pump, the program is going to figure out how many pumps to run with or without this number. The, the specification was just written and the control strategy was just written to provide that initial number of pumps, I, I guess, as a baseline. Um, so we had to do it that way, but the program is going to figure out how many pumps to run no matter what. Uh, now the other thing that we have is, let's say we're in a situation where we've got a, a really low wet well level. I'm sorry, really low reservoir level, and the, the thing's calling for five pumps to run. Okay, for whatever, whatever reason we have to have five pumps running. You only have, let's say you only have, you have five called that need to be running based on the algorithms, and the wet well level allows five pumps to run, but if you only have, if you only have three pumps available, what's going to happen is we, we take a value of two, five minus three, two, and what we do is we send a, a, a priority two message to shut down low priority and medium priority groundwater recharge stations so that we have the water available to go towards the reservoir, not being pulled out of the system. And what that does is, and we didn't do the groundwater recharge programming, but what we do is we generate this value of two that enables the groundwater recharge program to begin to shut down groundwater recharge stations on a low priority, medium priority, and high priority basis. So if we ever got a number of three in here, say we only had two pumps available, we're doing service or something like that, we've only got two pumps available, We'll, we'll return a three to the groundwater recharge logic, and that will shut down all the groundwater recharge stations until we get our reservoir level up to a point where we only need four. If we get to a point where we only have to have four pumps running, this, this number becomes a two that goes to the groundwater recharge, and all of a sudden, your high priority groundwater stations come on. Also, if we're running a lot of pumps and the wet well level drops, that'll affect the groundwater recharge values also. Does any BRB ever be used to help fill the tanks on the hill or is it just used for No, it's cell? it's used to, to bring water from from up north down here, down south. So if it calls for five but you don't have that available, it won't pump it from the other pumps. The PRV It, it, if the pressure is available, you, we can use the PRV to transfer, but the PRVs don't take the, the water all the way up to the reservoirs. Those reservoirs are up, uh, up off RP4. So, uh, so only the four 400 horsepower one. The, the 1158 pumps. Yeah, only yeah. those four pumps will actually pump up. Yeah. yeah. And there's uh, 1158 pumps at RP, RP4 that I believe also okay. pump to the same reservoirs. Okay. But that's a different, different program. Everything. Does anybody have any questions on the? What happens when your program fails? My program doesn't fail. <laughs> it does here. <laughs> is there a way to 
run these, uh, select to run these manually to oh, absolutely. maintain yeah. levels and stuff? Yeah, there, there's still local controls, there's still manual controls. This is the way it runs when it's running in automatic. And, That's uh, what Victor SD is for. <laughs> yeah. No, you still have all your existing controls of the pump station. You can start them, you can stop them locally at the MCC. None of that's changed. Uh, but like I said, the only thing that's changed is, is the automatic theory of operation, which is designed to fill the reservoirs on an optimum schedule. Okay. So any other questions on the reservoir logic? No? Where do you set your pump priority as far as we Mag one, mag two, mag three. It, it's, uh, it's generated on a first in, first out basis, and it's all handled within the PLC program. There's no operator intervention. Um, wh whichever pump is the first one to come on, that's the first one to shut off in, in any sequence. Uh, so, for example, let's say you've got three pumps running, lead, lag one, and lag two, and it's time to shut one of those pumps off. The lead pump shuts off. The lag one becomes lead and the lag two becomes lag one. And the previous lag three pump will become the lead pump. And the pump that's shut off becomes the lead pump. So it, it's always rotating to get even usage out of all the pumps. So if you have two pumps running, it's a race to see which third pump comes on. You send a start command to no, the no, other no. two pumps? Yeah. Hold on, just constant rotation. <coughs> Even if you show it off manually, it'll, it'll drop it. So it'll through. automatically it'll put, put that, that one in the program and put it in that bag and flag through it. Right. Okay. I was an artist in a past life. All right. So let's say you got the, the four pumps here. You've got lead, lag one, lag two, and lag three. What happens is if we need one pump to run, the lead pump will start. Actually, red, the lead pump will start. If you need two pumps to run, the lag one pump will start. If you need three pumps to run, the lag two pump will start. Okay, uh, from there, let's say that one of the pumps, all of a sudden now for some reason we need two pumps to run, we're, we're going to shed one of these pumps. What happens is this pump here shuts off and the lead lag status changes, lag three, lead, lag one, and lag two. And, and if we kept going through this system, like if we shut off another one, then this pump would become lag three, lead, lag one, lag two. And and they constantly operate that way. This was the first pump to come on in this sequence, and when it's time to shut off one of the pumps, this is the first pump to shut off. They call that uh, first in, first out logic. Is that what you're looking for, Joe? Does anybody else have any other questions? Let me see if I've got a, a graphic that shows that pretty well. Yeah. Of course not, because all these all these pictures were taken taken offline. Actually, you can kind of see it on uh, on page one of your HMI guide. It shows one in not ready, a lag one, and a lag two. But again, that was taken offline, so. Those aren't actual values that are going to be shown in the program. That's just what I had when I was um, editing the screens. So it doesn't show up very well. Now, if we brought another pump online right now with this situation, we would bring on the lag 2 pump. And that one's off because it's the lag 3. Now, let's say, here we go. Let's say something happens and the lag two pump fails. The lag two, this pump here, the lag one pump, this pump here fails. This pump all of a sudden becomes out of service. Okay. 
This pump stays the lead pump because it always was. Yeah. Or it was before. This one's out of service. This becomes lag one. This one becomes lag two. And it will start up because three pumps are required. Now, what do we do? Here's here's a here's here's a quiz. What do we do when this pump becomes available again? Lag go to lead. Lag three, exactly right. That one becomes lag three because it, it's already off. There's no reason to start and start start and stop pump, pumps unnecessarily. This will become the lag the new lag three pump because it was the last one made available. So that pump is now not running because only three pumps are required. Now when we shut one of these pumps off again, we shut off, where's the lead pump? We shut off the lead pump because we don't need it. This one becomes what? Lag three. Yep. This will become lag three. Okay. This one's off. This one becomes lag two. This one becomes lead. And this one becomes lag one. So we've still got the lead pump and the lag one pump are still the ones that are running. That way. We even out the, the pump usage throughout the day as we're switch, adding and subtracting pumps. We, and we don't start and stop pumps unnecessarily when we, when we switch the lead lag rotation. And all that's handled in the PLC program. There's, there's no operator controls to change which pump is in the lead, lag one, lag two. That, that can't be done by um, human beings. <laughs> A machine does that. Any other questions about lead lag logic? Or lead lag switching? Okay, you race. All right, remote reset. I know Joe knows about this one. Yep. He helped me out. All this does is, uh, it used to be a situation where if a pump failed under certain conditions, like a vibration or, or a, a motor winding over temperature or something like that, you had to have somebody from electrical come out and chain, reset it on the multi lid We've added, as part of this project, a remote reset where that alarm can be reset from the HMI on SCADA. All you have to do is push the normal alarm reset button that would normally be pushed and that will clear that alarm. The only difference is no one alarm can be cleared more than three times in a 24 hour period. So if you have the same alarm occur three times in a 24 hour period, that's fine. You can reset it from the HMI. But after that, it's going to require somebody to come in and take a look at it and reset it. It won't reset remotely any more than that. Now, that applies to all three pump stations, 930, 1050, and 1158. This makes everybody's life easier, they say. Any questions on remote reset?
if after the third time, like say an operator switch shifts or something, mm -hmm. they go to reset it remotely, we'll, we'll tell them there on the screen this thing is already, no, this it, is the third time, or, you know. It just will not reset the multi lens. Okay. It's, it's going to, and if the, re, if the multi lens not reset, the pump won't restart, the alarm won't clear, it'll just be like push the button that <coughs> does nothing. Doing nothing. Yeah. So they'll have to get somebody out there to go out and take a look at the multi lens and do what is normally done here if there's those types of alarms. So uh, it's supposed to make everybody's job better. Hopefully it does. <coughs> any questions on that? Are there any alarms that aren't remotely resettable? You're, you're resetting all the alarms? It resets anything. It resets anything. Uh, currently, there's, there's one aspect of this that I still have to do the programming for, and that's to send a reset command to the VFD over device net. Next time I'm on site working on this project, I'll, that's what I'll be doing. I was going to say, we hit the multi then, but I don't think we hit the VFD. Right. Uh, I still have to program that. The device net cable and all that's already there. I just have to send the bit to reset the... Uh, so this is only for alarms from the multi lane. Right. Not, if it, not if it's on the cutler hammer <laughs> keypad, pad, like a right. unit over temperature, it won't reset that? That's what he needs to program that in on device. Yeah. That will be done. But it's, it ha that hasn't been programmed yet. It's not an instantaneous trip. It's still remotely resettable. If it's programmed into the bolt high end, to be able to reset it, yes. All right. Uh, welcome back. One thing I forgot to mention is that um, the programming this project is melded in with your existing system, your existing controls. So there are aspects of the controls and the, the program and the system that I'm not aware of. So sometimes when you ask me a question, um, I didn't provide the grand total of the project. I provided an add-on to the programming and the controls that were already there. So it's a, it's a modification. There will be some things I don't know, but there's stuff that was existing. It's not, uh, it's not anything that we have provided that I'm not going to be able to answer. So just want to let you guys know that. Um, on the PRVs, uh, the, the, three, the PRVs have different control modes. Uh, for the 1050 930 PRV, it'll operate in meet demand mode. And what that means is, uh, going back to the pump, pump uh, logic, if the 930 pump station has decided that it needs to have three pumps running, but only two pumps are available, and it, it's the same for the 1050, 1150, 8 PRV, if an additional pump is required, but it's not available, the PRV will begin to open up, and it will take the place of that final pump in the, in the system, whatever it is. Uh, on the 1158, it can be the, the fifth pump in the system. Is that right? I don't know right now. But whatever it is, whatever the final pump in the system is, the, the PRV will take over. In meet demand mode, once the PRV starts to open, all the pumps are locked in at 100%, and they'll stay at 100% as long as the PRV is open. And the PRV is pulse modulated to control the pressure to what it needs to be. Once the demand drops to a point that's sufficient that the PRV doesn't need to be open, the PRV will pulse itself closed and then PIDs will control the speed of the pumps that's providing the pressure to the zone. Uh, that's both for the 930 zone and the 1050 zone, both of which are controlled based on pressure, not reservoir level. Reservoir level only controls the 1158 pumps. Maintain pressure mode. Uh, the 1050-930 PRV will, is also designed to maintain pressure in the 930 zone. Uh, if the 930 pressure drops too low, the PRV will start to open. And it will open as much as it needs to to achieve the 930's pressure goal without starving the 1050 zone. If it starts to starve the 1050 zone of pressure, then it will stop opening. And it will do its best, the PRV will do its best to maintain um, ideal pressure between 1050 and 930. Once the 930 pressure is restored to where it needs to be, the PRV will close back up again and will resume back to normal operation. 
Um, same thing with the 1050-1158 zone. If the 1050 is lacking pressure and the pumps can't provide it, then the PRV will also open up, provide pressure from the 1158 zone into the 1050 zone, and it will provide pressure to the 1050 zone as long as it does not rob the 1158 zone of pressure. Any questions on either of those two modes of operation? 1158 PRV will also open up in reservoir relief mode and what that does is if the reservoir gets too full and there's, a, there's an operator set point on the HMI screen if the reservoir gets too full the PRV is going to open and bleed off some of that water and bring it down down south and it's going to get something's going to get done with it once it gets down into the 1050 zone. Would that control the downstream pressure? I'm sorry? Downstream pressure control that? This is only controlled, well, yes, downstream pressure will prevent it from opening, um, but it's triggered by the level in the reservoir. Okay, so you got reservoir level, you got time, you got wet well level, and you got pressure. Exactly. Those four modes all have to be in conjunction in order for a system to work. Yes. And one of the four are out of whack, they ain't working. Nothing will work, exactly right. And that's why I was out here for many days of startup getting everything to work together. Because you can see between all this, plus the, the, um, the fact that I've already discussed the, the filling of the reservoir with the pumps, getting everything to work together took a little bit of work. But we got everything working really, really smoothly, every mode of operation. And one mode of operation won't inhibit another from working. In other words, if the, if the reservoir gets too high, it tells the PRV to open, it will still respond to, to either of these conditions if it becomes required. So what, whatever's going on within the system, the PRVs are going to do the best to accommodate it. Um, now let's say, for example, something I mentioned earlier, mentioned earlier the, uh, the reservoir level gets too full and the PLC tells the PRV to open, 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 open. Well, if you get too much pressure in the, in the 1050 zone, the hydraulic controls might kick in and close the PRV even though the PLC wants the PRV to open. But then again, the PRV has also got a pressure algorithm in the PLC program that will not open the PRV, like you said, if the pressure gets too high in the 1050 zone. So it, it, it's, got, it's got double double security. It's got the hydraulic controls that if our stuff fails, the hydraulic controls will take over. But through days upon days of testing, we haven't seen the program fail yet. You have this all written down in plain language in an operational manual? It is written down in the uh, contractual uh, control strategy that was provided with the contract. I don't have it printed out today, but it, it looks like this. It's got, it's got the control strategies for the, uh, for the whole project. Uh, this this also this project also included 1299 pump station, but we didn't work on that. We only worked on the RP1 pump stations. Okay. I don't have anything written by Trimax. Would Steve have that? He he has access to it. Okay. I don't know if he has it for sure, but he has access to it. And that's the document that I use to uh, do the programming. Okay. The HMI and PLC. For the most part, it's three separate systems. The PRBs are de designed where one system needs help. That exactly. Help right. Exactly right. Yeah. 930 is south zone, that just feeds down south. 1050 is the two the three Philly pumps that basically does plant water. And 1158 is the, the four zone 2B pumps and that basically just goes up the hill. But if one system needs help, then that's the PRBs. Mm -hmm. Well, you know Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Thank you, Joe. I, I, I didn't think about that. I can feel the heat from the sun coming through the wall and coming through this marker board. This marker board is actually warm. That's not important. Um, yeah, thanks, Joe. In, in case there's any of you that needed, 
one of the noun names or it makes it easier. Uh, I wrote that up here. So the 1050 is the Philly, 1158 is zone 2B, and 930 is called cell zone. So I understand that you used to use the, uh, the noun names, and during sometime during this project, Steve had told me you want to start, we want to start using the, the pressure zones, which is 930, 1050, 1158. So that's what I forced myself to start calling them. So I've been doing that all, all training. Sorry if I didn't put that up sooner. Probably should have done that. Any questions? Where'd they drive those numbers from? 930, 1050? I have no idea. Just random numbers? Let's call them 930. <laughs> <laughs> Elevations. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is it? Thanks. Yeah, Elevations. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> now I know too, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on that? Do you guys normally use the HMI, the, the graphic interface, or not? Do we just need to see the hardware, or do you guys want to push the buttons on the, on the HMI? Is that something you guys do? I don't know. I don't know about these guys, but I do it. You do it? Yeah. Okay. We'll go. We'll go. We'll we'll take a look at the flow meters. We'll take a look at the uh, the PRVs. Uh, Clayball did or is going to do. I don't know which. The Clayball training. So I'm just going to show you where the where the PRVs are, um, and we'll we'll get in and I'll I'll show you the I'll open up the panel and show you the the wiring additions that we've added and we'll go over to the HMI screens. We'll have some questions and we'll call it a day. Get you guys out of here by three o'clock. So that I don't have to pay overtime times nine. <laughs> <laughs> One thing the operator used to let us run those a lot on our own before the PRVs. Okay. And if we need to shut something down, they just say shut it down, go ahead. But now okay. because of the PRVs, we gotta be really careful and let the operators because some the PRV valves are sometimes slow to they got to maintain a certain amount of pressure on this line and it can't go up too high or too low. So you got to work with operators a lot more carefully on these than we used to have to. Yeah, and, and I think the the speed the program controls the PRVs at right now is somewhere around 2% a minute. So you're not going to get a fast response out of it. If the PRV is moving really fast, it's in hydraulic control. If it's moving really slow, it's being controlled by the SCADA. That way, with the, with the SCADA controls, we don't move anything too fast and cause a pressure spike or a pressure dip because that's uh, high priority not do those kinds of things. There's your, there's your, PRV. There's your PRV. This is the sensor. This is the transmitter right here. I'm just going to pop the cover off this. You guys can gather around if you want. Right now, it shows the flow through here. This is the 1050, 1158. It shows no flow right now, which means the PRV is closed. Uh, and I can look at the shaft on the PRV and tell that, yes, the PRV is closed. Uh, but what you can do, uh, I'm going to show you the, uh, the test screw, the test leads and stuff like that. Take the cover off here with the standard number two Phillips. Make a note of that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, right here in this corner are uh, 31, 31 and 32, which is your current test leads right here. This LED is the power on indicator. And I've been good at this, the camera. This display module can actually be taken off. We're not going to worry about doing it, but that, that can be pulled off of there too. If you want to get behind there and get to the cert card. Normally you shouldn't need to. Uh, if there's any service issues, like I say, uh, first you give us a call. And then if, if after that, if we have to, we'll refer it to the back for you. Anybody have any questions on this? It's pretty straightforward. All right, for this project, 
Primax added a new rack into this uh, PLC cabinet right here. So what I'm going to do is show you the new rack and the new cards. Show you where the new I.O. is. And then we'll go through the HMI screens. Let you guys look at the HMI screens and feel a little bit comfortable with them. this 10 slot rack it's got it's got a, a digital input card a digital output card and an analog input card the digital input card reads the status of the PRV um, and uh, that's it it's just the PRV statuses the analog input reads the uh, flow through the PRV and the, P the flow through the flow meter and the PRV p position the digital output is what controls the pulses for opening and closing the PRV. Uh, the program's written in here, and we've added um, from this, from here down, we've added all this. This is all our controls going out to the field to uh, read the statuses and control the PRV. This is the hardware we've got. Uh, This is an analog card here. Here's your analog fuses. We had to power up. Uh, we had to power. We had to source for the position indicator, but the flow is this, is is the flow meter sources the flow value. So some of these are wired as source, and some of them are wired as sync. So if you're looking at the flow meter, keep in mind that it's sourced out in the field, and if you're looking at the position indicator. Remember that it's sourced from here. Uh, this is your inputs, all your status inputs, and this is your outputs going out to the field. We have our panel drawings right here. But this shows all of our inputs and outputs. This drawing here shows the uh, the digital inputs, which is the uh, the flow meter fault and uh, valve, the PRV limit switches. This is your output, which is the controls to the four solenoids, the open and close for each PRV. And here's your analog inputs, which is the flow meter position indicator. Uh, sorry, the PRV position indicator and the flow meter flow value. So those are in here, and there's the terminal board layout. The I.O. The IO that we've added here and, and what it looked like before we started. So you can see that this whole, this whole section right here, all this is what we've added for this project. Does anybody have any questions about the drawings or what's going on inside here? Close it up and we'll push the buttons on the HMI. All right. Here's the RP1 pump station overview. It's got 1158 and 1050. The 930 pumps are controlled by the building next door, so we don't have access to those from here. This is the pump station overview. You've got uh, you've got your two PRVs showing here and here. Sorry, here and here. On the status, they're both green, which means they're both closed right now. Okay. Two ways you can get to the different pump stations. If you want to get to the 1158 pump station from here, you click right there. It'll take you to the pump station. Here again, we have the 16-inch PRV, which is out there. We have the existing 10-inch PRV that I have no idea where it is. Here's your reservoirs, the 1158 reservoirs, which are up at RP4. They're, at, they're actually at the, uh, at the uh, power plant across the street from RP4. 
Um, and then we go back here to RP1 pump station PRV overview. Here's the 1050 pump station. We've got a PRV here and a PRV here, just like on the 1158. So we got three pumps. <coughs> Lead, lag one, and lag two. Here's the reservoir level. We got the level of the two reservoirs. They float together, so they're almost always within a tenth of a foot of each other, unless they're isolated for some reason. From the 1158 screen, apparently only, you can get to the pump station overview screen. And that'll take you to either 1158 or 1050. You can also use these navigation buttons on the bottom. We've got a button for the zone 1050 pumps. We've got a, a zone for, you can't read it right now because the curves are there. We got a button for the 1158 pumps. You got your 1158 pumps. You got lead leg one, leg two, and leg three. 1050 pumps are here. Lead leg one and leg two. The red graphic means that the pump is running. The green graphic means the pump is off. Same with the PRV. <coughs> Excuse me. Green means it's closed. Red means it's open. I don't have any PRVs open right now, so I can't show you what it looks like. But again, on both screens, we've got the well well level and the reservoir level. For the controls, for the pumps, you push on here. You get it, it's in remote, which means it's in remote at the MCC. The local remote button is in remote. It's in, in automatic, and it's the lead pump right now. If, it was, if you push this button, you can put it in manual. Don't do that, because I'll get in trouble. And then you can start and stop the pump. Actually, what will happen if I put this in manual right now is this pump would go to not available. This would become the lead. <coughs> this will become the lag one. And these two pumps will run, and this pump will shut off. But we're not going to do that. This slider right here, will control the pump speed in manual. If you start the pump in manual, you can control the pump speed with this slider, zero to 100%. It also shows the uh, run times in hours. Today's run time, yesterday's run time, how long it's run in the last week, in the last two weeks, and in the last 30 days. That's the same for every pump, and the same for every pump on both pump stations. You got automatic and remote. Pump start stop is the same button for the 1158 pumps. It's in service and it's lag one. Close button will close it. PRV screens, same thing. You got a PRV graphic. It changes red or green. <coughs> Auto manual button. If it's in manual, you can control the PRV button with this slider right here. PRV position will tell you what percent open the PRV is. If it says 100%, that means it's all the way open, not all the way closed. PRV maintain. If the PLC program wants the PR PRV to open, it's going to say PRV opening. If the PLC program wants the PRV to close, it's going to say PRV closing. If the PLC program wants the PRV to stay right where it's at, it's going to say PRV maintain. So this word right here is what the PLC program wants the PRV to do. You got your relevant uh, values, uh, your, your flow through the PRV, your up, upstream pressure, downstream pressure, Zone 930 pressure, <coughs> excuse me, the level in the two reservoirs, the wet well level, 
and your your pressure and your level set points for the PRVs are right here. You got the almost the same identical screen for both PRVs. The 105930 PRV is a little bit different. It's got two less, it's got three less set points. <coughs> the zone 930 pressure set point is set in the HMI in the other building and it's sent over here over Ethernet. So you can't set that set point. But you can set the sustaining pressure set point here. Again, there's the manual set point. PRV's closed. Looks like we have a little bit of analog error right here because it says the position is half percent. PRV is actually closed. Okay, system utility. Zone 1158 level settings. Here are your reservoir set points and your wet well set points along with the reservoir level here and the, re the, re and the wet well level. The reservoir is at 21 feet. The wet well level is at 18.1. If the wet well drops below 17.2, we'll start shedding pumps. <coughs> we'll shed a pump every three tenths of a foot. If the wet well gets down to 15 feet, we'll shed down all the pumps one by one. 